Thank you, Median, for bringing uh, some joy. I appreciate that. That's, uh, you know, so many times church can be very serious, and it is a serious thing that we, when we talk about God and our eternity and so forth, but uh, it's a good thing for us to smile, right? Amen. Thanks for having me back, and uh, see if I can do a little better on the slides this time than I did last time. So, um, I want to share with you something that's, that is very close to my heart and uh, is probably one of my favorite topics. And you've probably, Pastor Schaller has probably gone through it a few times with you, but uh, since we had Easter a couple of weeks ago, my friend Ron Pakel, who's pastor up in Berkeley, and I, we work together a lot on different projects. Uh, he, he said after their Easter service in Berkeley, he said, so Terry, what am I going to preach on next? And I said, well, why don't you talk about what happened with the uh, people who believed in Jesus? Because that was what they asked too. What's next? What's next? So I want to talk about the people of the way today. Recently, my wife and I watched a documentary about the struggles and the scandals uh, that have rocked a prominent megachurch. You would probably mostly all know the name of the church, but I won't really talk about that so much. It's a global movement claiming to be all about Jesus, but uh, it's been characterized, uh, unfortunately, by more by celebr celebrity leaders who like money and uh, really, really expensive clothes and jets and whatever. All kinds of scandals have come into the organization. There's an ins insatiable thirst, it seems, for more money, more numbers, more fame. And I came away wondering uh, as I watched this, and I've done so often before, if Paul or Peter or John were here today, would they recognize the church? As it is in all of its different forms, not just one organization, but even our own organization. During the pandemic, the church has been challenged like never before. Our assumptions about what it means to have and to be a church have been redefined by, uh, by the simple reality of not being able to assemble together in the way that we have in the past. I'm glad to see that you all are assembling together here this morning and that you have a place to do it. Um, I, I was reading a study done by a church growth and church life expert, Carrie Newhoff, and he's identified 12 disruptive trends from the pandemic that are facing the church of the 21st century. All of them clearly indicate that things will never be the same as we have been accustomed to. And if we don't pay special attention, not only to trends, but to what Jesus had in mind when he first established the church, we're going to be in trouble. But if we do pay attention to that, uh, we will thrive as a church. So the question remains, does what we have seen and called church even faintly resemble the new community of the early Christians? Is the church a business or is it a program? Did Jesus set up a franchise for the faithful or a religious real estate agency? Is it really about liturgy and theology and codes of con conduct? What is the church? When I read the New Testament, it reminds me that Jesus did not come to establish a religious business model or a new program for spiritual success. And Jesus certainly did not found his church on a set of rules. In his day, there were lots and lots of rules. He said, I'm going to give you one that, that preempts all of them. What was that? I give you a new commandment to do what? To love one another. Not just to love one another, but to love one another as I have loved you. Now, if you think it's hard to keep the 10, can you imagine how hard it is to keep the 11th <laughs> from your heart? And yet that's what Jesus founded his church on. He founded his church not on rules, but on relationships, because that's what God has always, always wanted. He's always wanted a relationship with his people. He's wanted his people on earth to understand that they're part of his heavenly family. So I, I chose the text for today from the words of Christ. 
uh, on the night before he, he was crucified because he kind of sets the stage for what we're going to talk about. And Thomas comes and he says, we, we don't know where you're going, Lord. And how can we know the way? How can we follow you and if we don't know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So that's what we're talking about today is the people of the day, uh, people of the way. Paul uh, found himself on trial, uh, accused by his own uh, countrymen of being a, 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 a rebellious uh, rabble rouser and, and someone who is causing all kinds of trouble. So he's, he's in front of Felix, the governor, the Roman governor, and he's defending himself for his teaching. And he says this, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. Which they call a sect. See, the first Christians were not called Christians. They were called people of the way. That is the way of Christ. Defending him, uh, the new community known as the way was not about the religion or lifestyle or special knowledge that they had already known. The way was and the way is all about the person of Christ, all about the person of Christ. And the early believers were all about Jesus. To them, Jesus was a real person. You know, because I grew up, uh, you know, I think I... I probably was born in a church. I loved church when I was a kid. I, I'm religious. I'm a pastor, all kinds of things like that. Uh, but because I've had so much religion, and many people experience the same thing, going to church week after week, we tend to, to create this, this bubble around Jesus as if he's an idea or if he's an emotion or if he's a teaching. But the early believers knew Jesus as a real person. The return of Christ was to them a promise, and they were expecting Jesus to come back in their lifetime. They thought that he was going to come back, finish everything off, and, and uh, do exactly what he had promised to do. The early be believers discovered in Jesus that love was not just an idea. It was a way of life. It was actually a way of life. And our sister uh, had in her prayer some... Uh, some ideas and thoughts about, about how we are to love each other. Um, that's what Jesus said. That's the foundation of his church. So in the book of Acts, we discover five characteristics, five characteristics of this new community. And I want to look at those uh, today. We aren't, we aren't going to spend a lot of time on each one, but I just want to remind you of what those are. These are uh, come from the book of Acts, mainly Acts 2 and Acts 4. And different people might put them down different ways, but these are the things that I've really seen. They jump out at me. So I'm going to share those with you today. So the first one is a, a word that you've heard probably many times, a Greek word called koinonia. And, and the word koinonia is basically fellowship, but it's not just getting together for donuts and coffee or, sorry, or uh, crackers and post them, depending on uh, how you, how you uh, see it. Fellowship is this deep abiding connection between people. It's, it's really the foundation of what we call true community. And, and it actually, the word koinonia is a word, a, a, a word that Christianity has brought into the English le lexicon, not so much koinonia, but the word fellowship. That's where fellowship comes from. It comes from the early church. Acts 1.14 tells us that this fellowship had already begun even before the day of Pentecost. It says they all met, that is all the believers met together continually for prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. Even before Pentecost, we see the new community coming together, and then Pentecost happens. And on Pentecost, uh, on the day of Pentecost, one of the observations of, of Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, is this in uh, Acts 2, 44 through 46. All the believers met together constantly 
and shared everything they had. They sold their possessions and shared the proceeds with those in need. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. You know, that's just it's, it's this, little, this little window into the life of the early believers. And all of those things challenge us, don't they? Can you imagine if we met together constantly? It doesn't say they met together every week on the Sabbath day in a church building. It says they met together constantly. The early believers didn't have a church building, did they? Well, they had the temple, but the temple had lots of temple guards, you know, had lots of things that, that would distract them. They were there but they, they had each other, and so they would get together in small groups. They would get together in homes, wherever they could meet together, maybe out on the hillside like Jesus had taught them to do. They shared everything that they had. They prayed, they shared their possessions, they met together regularly and shared their food. <laughs> shared their food. Uh, there was no yours and mine with the early believers. There was just ours. There was ours. This is a group of people without fear. There's no fear because Jesus has taken away their fear. Uh, John, many, many years later, writes that perfect love uh, casts out all fear. There is no fear in love because perfect love casts out our, all fear. And these people experienced that. They weren't afraid of anything or anyone because they knew Jesus was their Lord and their master. They were not afraid to be open about their faith. They were not afraid to share. They were not afraid to be vulnerable and real. And I really appreciated Rudy's uh, uh, sharing his experience with the, the guy. At, was it in Costco that that uh, happened? Someone trying to, uh, you know, sell solar uh, solar equipment, well, he had, he had more of the sun of righteousness <laughs> to share than he had solar equipment to sell. And, and uh, that's how it has to be, that we can share our faith without fear. I think sometimes we're afraid that if we share our faith, that we're trying to share something we believe in and we're trying to convince somebody else of what we think and what we believe in. But sharing your faith is just simply saying, I know somebody that I think you would really like to get to know. It's like uh, going to a party and inviting a friend and say, you know, the people that are going to be there, they're great people. You are going to have a good time. You're going to love it. You're going to love them. And that's what it is to share Jesus. So what would it look like if our relationships both in the church and out of the church, didn't have fear in them. We weren't afraid of what people thought of us. We weren't afraid of the way they might judge us. We weren't afraid of the fact that they might discover if we get too close that there's some flaws or there's some problems that we might have in our lives. Because I haven't met a, a single human being in my lifetime who didn't have some problems somewhere in their lives, either relational problems, maybe addictions, financial problems. We all go through stuff because we're all human. But that's what can draw us together because Jesus says, I'm here with you. And so their trust in Jesus Christ as a person gave them uh, the ability not to have fear in their lives. In addition to koinonia, I see in... in uh, the story of the early church, the fact that they had the proclamation. It was the announcement of the good news. And I think a lot of times we get good news confused with bad news. I've heard so many sermons and so many talks over my lifetime about the gospel, and it ended up being really bad news because it was all about how bad things are out there, how many wars there are, how much disease there is, how we need to be afraid of this group of people or this way of teaching instead of preaching and teaching the truly good news of Jesus Christ. In the early church, that's what they had. They had this passion about the good news of Jesus. Peter continued preaching, it says, in Acts 2. 
for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this generation that has gone astray. He wasn't afraid to call sin by its right name, if you want to say it that way, or to identify the evils in his society and his generation. But he says, save yourselves. How do we do that? Well, you come to Christ. You accept Jesus as your Savior. Those who believed what, what Peter said were baptized and added to the church about 3,000 in all. Now, I have been guilty, as many pastors and, and uh, church teachers have been, of, of ignoring everything else in Acts 2 and focusing on the 3,000. Well, that's not the big deal. The big deal is what brought 3,000 people to the point where they would be baptized with this little sect of people that, that were considered to be not only offshoots, but they were considered to be a threat to the existing uh, religious order. Well, it was Jesus, wasn't it? That's the big deal. This is the day of Pentecost with 3,000 converts. What is it that they proclaimed? The followers of Jesus Christ proclaimed the good news that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. That salvation comes through Jesus. Their faith was not a private affair or an exclusive club. The believers who made up this new community wanted everyone to know that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. Their message was based on the teachings and the prophecies of Scripture. I, 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 I love the story in, I think it's in Luke, isn't it? Of uh, the two guys that were going back home after the weekend of the crucifixion, and they were all discouraged, and Jesus joins them, but they don't know who he is, you know. And, and it says that as they walked along, first of all, he called them fools. That's a little uncharacteristic of, of the way we think of Jesus, you know. He said, don't call anyone a fool or you'll be in danger of hellfire. And he's saying, you fools. Well, some of the more contemporary uh, translations say, you idiots. I don't know which is worse, fool or idiot. But he was saying, you don't know, you don't understand. You, you project your own interpretation idea onto the scriptures. And it says that he opened up the scriptures and showed them all the prophecies about himself and how they were to be fulfilled. And so often we read the Bible for everything but what they're, how they're about Jesus. Do you realize how many prophecies there are of Jesus in the Old Testament? Of the Christ? Of the Messiah? And why don't we spend time, as, at least as much time there, uh, as we do in some of these other areas that are kind of like, well, that's a nice idea, and maybe we should think that way, but it's not going to make a difference in your eternal salvation. But Jesus is. So the main focus was how these things, these teachings and prophecies of scriptures, how they pointed to Jesus as Messiah. They told the stories of his life. They told about their own experiences with Jesus. They recounted his suffering and his death. They talked about his resurrection, talked about his resurrection, not just one day a year, you know, on Easter or on Passover. They talked about his resurrection all the time because they saw Jesus alive after they had seen him murdered on a cross. <laughs> if you or I had seen that, we'd probably be talking about it too, right? They boldly declared that all of them, all the Jewish people, had had a part in his death. All the disciples owned up to it. They told about his resurrection and the promise that Jesus made of salvation to everyone who believed in him. They called the people to repent, to believe, to be baptized in the name of Jesus. This was the gospel proclaimed by the apostles and the followers of Jesus. The truth they preached always had Jesus as the core, as the foundation, as the center. I grew up being taught that we had the truth as Seventh-day Adventists. And I finally learned as, as an adult that the truth has got to have you. In fact, the truth is a person. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. Many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of believers now totaled about 5,000 men, and, and not counting women and children. 
I missed a slide here, but that's all right. Every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. It's still the gospel message. It hasn't changed. It hasn't gotten better. It hasn't morphed into something else. It's the same message. What does it mean that Jesus is the Messiah? What does that actually mean to us in our lives? Well, when I, when I thought about that, I, I just started asking questions of myself. Do I need to be saved in some way? Do I need to be delivered or helped? Am I broken? Do I have things that have happened in my life that have just broken me? Have I become lost? Am I tired? Anybody here ever get tired? I mean, not just physically tired, but you just get tired of life as it is on planet Earth. Weighs down on you, keeps you awake at night. Are you anxious or sinful or addicted? Have you become burned out? I don't care if it's burned out on your job or burned out on your religion. It doesn't matter. Are you burned out or are you enslaved? Are you hurting? Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior the deliverer, the helper, the healer, the provider. He's the comforter and counselor. He's your advocate. He's your substitute. He's your friend and companion and guide. He could probably join Pathfinders without having to take any tests, right? Jesus is everything that we need in our lives. So many of the people who heard the message believed it. And the number of the number of believers now totaled about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So by this time in Acts 4, there's probably 12 to 15,000 believers just in a short time after Jesus goes back to heaven. Why do you think we're not growing as a church? I mean, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the United States, or in the Western, Western uh, world, you know, there's a lot of books written about that, a lot of studies done, a lot of conversations, both informally in local churches and, and uh, professionally and formally within the organization. But maybe it's because we're not so sold out to Jesus, so focused on him, so passionate about the gospel message as the early believers were. You think it would make a difference if we were? I do. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Many of the pastors were converted too. Amen. We need to be converted, that's for sure. The church exploded with growth because the believers offered what the people had been looking for, waiting for, hoping for, and praying for, and they found it all. In Jesus. The third characteristic that I've discovered in the book of Acts is the characteristic of devotion, or another word for that is discipleship, devotion. It says in Acts 2.42, they joined with the other believers and devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, sharing in the Lord's Supper and in prayer. I mean, just that verse, uh, you could spend a lot of time, you know, fleshing it out. You could have a, a great Bible study. In fact, you could have several Bible studies just on that one verse. What did the early believers devote themselves to? Did they devote themselves to Netflix? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a pandemic and we all wanted to watch some good shows on Netflix, but they didn't devote themselves to they devoted themselves to getting to know Christ, but they devoted them, themselves to the teachings that the apostles had. They devoted themselves to, to uh, fellowship with each other and particularly the sharing of the Lord's Supper. We have uh, strong in indications in the book of Acts that the, uh, the early believers celebrated the Lord's Supper every time they sat down to a meal together because they were so thankful for God's provision, first of all, of God's Son, that they used that as an opportunity to share uh, in what they called the agape feast or the love feast together. It wasn't uh, once a quarter. It was a lot, maybe more than one time a week. 
So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the messianic prophecies and their fulfillment in Christ, the kingdom manifesto, if you want to call it that, uh, Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus lays out his whole, his whole uh, kingdom. He said, this is the way the kingdom of God works in this world. Read that, read uh, Matthew 5 through 7 with that in mind. And you'll discover things you never saw before. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching about the death, the ministry and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the core. That was like the pivotal point. The fact that Jesus had been crucified and he came back to life. No one ever has done that, particularly not after a Roman encounter with the cross. And then it says they devoted themselves to fellowship and sharing the Lord's Supper. They loved to be together. They loved to eat together. You guys like to eat together? This pandemic has been horrible because we haven't been able to have potluck, right? Or just to get together and have a, a, a meal with family and friends. Last night we met with family, uh, several families together that it's all kind of related and uh, had a meal together. I wasn't going to eat anything because I knew I had to preach today. I didn't want a foggy brain, but I just couldn't resist the tacos and the guacamole and uh, the rice and all of it, you know, all of it. It was all vegetarian. It was okay. It was okay. But uh, it wasn't even the food. It was just being able to be together, to connect with one another, just to smile and to see how everyone was doing. We were surprised by one, one of the couples that came down from uh, uh, Chico, um, parents of my stepdaughter, uh, yeah, parents of my stepdaughter's husband. And, uh, and they've been through some really, really tough medical and physical issues lately. And to see them sitting there, they'd survived the long journey and they're partaking and participating with us. It was just a good, good time. The early believers loved each other. They loved to be together. They loved to eat together. What if as we're able to with the pandemic lifting, or maybe even on Zoom. During, during the pandemic, I was on many different Zoom meetings or calls where we would have a, a, a Bible study or just a, a fellowship together. But what if you met with a group of people every week, just people that you get to know, like the gentleman in Costco, you invite him to a, me a, a meal, not a meeting, a meal. And you have... You have six or eight people around the table and you just ask a simple question of everyone after everyone's got some food in their bellies, got some good Martinelli's down, you know. Um, so what, what was your life like this week? Just ask questions. Why do we have to always give them answers before anybody asks questions, you know? So, so what was your life like this week? What, were, what was the lowest point of your life this week and or the highest point, and then just let people talk. And just have, see how God opens the doors into people's hearts and lives with simple questions like that. Simple uh, fellowship, simple community around a meal. What would it be like if you took the time to intentionally get to know some other believers and share your lives in a meaningful way? There is strength when we connect with other people who love Jesus Christ, whether they're of our particular persuasion or not. If we worship Jesus, if he truly is the center of our lives, God will bring us all to the place where we need to be. I mean, is there anybody here who thinks they've gotten all the knowledge that they're ever going to get before, you know, before you become perfected and sanctified and holified and, and in the kingdom forever, you know, in heaven forever? I mean, I got stuff in my understanding and my belief system. I'm sure if Jesus came and sat down with me, he would say, you know, Terry, you think this A, B, C, and D, but you are so off base. <laughs> and I'd have to sit there like, okay, Lord, teach me, teach me. What if we just really got together with Jesus as the center and the focus of our lives? The fourth uh, characteristic that I see in Acts is this, spirit-filled and spirit-led. 
spirit-filled and spirit-led. Ministry and service, the way that we do ministry and the way that we serve. Acts 2, 1 to 4 says, Everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And that's just one little tiny sliver of, of what the Holy Spirit brought to the early church. The gifts, we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, but the greatest gift is the Spirit, is the very presence of the Holy Spirit that we welcome God into our present reality. Jesus said, you're going to do well that I go away because I'm going to send my spirit to be with you. I'm going to send another comforter and it'll be better than if I'm here because I'm limited in space and time to one place at a time. But the spirit is with everybody everywhere all the time. And so God is with us all the time. And, and I can say for myself so many times and so often I am living my life without that constant awareness. It's as if God just kind of left me down here and wants me to pray to him once in a while, but I'm on my own and I got to figure it out. No, the Holy Spirit is with us. He is the gift. He is the gift. If there's a secret to the first centuries, century church's success, this is it. They were open to, they were filled with, and they were surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Now that takes courage. That takes intention. It doesn't just happen accidentally. Acts 2.43 says, A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. What kind of miraculous signs and wonders does God want to do through us that gives him glory, not us, that would, that would revolutionize the way that ministry takes place in our world. People today need Jesus, right? They need healing. They need hope. They need ways to, to fix their lives, not just in this present world, but for the world to come. And God says, if you will let me, I will use you to bring that to the people that are in your world. One of the most revolutionary, revolutionary developments in the early church was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Regular people, just ordinary folks, I don't know how many PhDs, MDivs, uh, MDs, I don't know what all the qualifications and certificates that we all have in this room, but I know uh, at the core of it all, we're all just people, right? We all... You know, get up in the morning, we all get hungry, we all need sleep, we all do things. We're just human beings, we're just people. And, and, and for the first time in their memory, the ministry of God was taking place through regular people, through ordinary people. They were doing the work of God because they were filled with God. Not because they read a manual or went to a class, but because they caught the vision. And they couldn't help themselves. I came here to preach today because uh, when, when uh, I think it was Joni reached out to me, somebody on email, I just couldn't say no. <laughs> I just couldn't say no. Yeah, it's about 80 miles one way to get here. And yeah, the traffic is horrendous. And yeah, there's a lot of hateful, selfish people on the road, if you know what I'm talking about. But we, my friend Ron and I had just finished talking about this whole idea, and I thought, I'm just going to say yes, because I think that's what God wants me to do. Not because I'm a successful pastor. I'm out. <laughs> I'm out on my own. My wife tells me what to do now, way more than she ever used to. Ministry was taken out of the hands of the professional clergy and placed into the hands of ordinary folk. When Jesus went back to his Father, he left men and women who had already participated in healing and teaching and delivering people from demons. For over three years, they followed Jesus around, and they had taken part in feeding thousands. I'll bet you guys over the course of the life of this church, you've fed thousands, right? I mean, if you added it all up, 
Uh, the last couple years, maybe not so much, but uh, they had fed thousands. They had given to the poor. They performed miracles and invited people to hear Jesus. But their experience and their training needed an internal fire. They couldn't just always rely on Jesus to be their motivation because when Jesus wasn't present, things often went south, right? I mean, when Jesus was off alone praying somewhere, his disciples found themselves arguing with each other over who's better than the other guy or who deserved to be closer to Jesus than someone else. And so they needed that internal fire, that, that goodness of God within. And that fire was the Holy Spirit who brought a new revelation to them. And the revelation is this. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. God's presence and power uh, is for all people, not just for a chosen few. God makes no distinction between men and women, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, powerful or weak in terms of ministry. Everyone is invited into the family of God. Amen? I mean, that should be, we should just be shouting that from the rooftops and making it real by doing it to open the doors to anyone that comes. Ron, my friend, told me last night, he said, I had a conversation with this lady who had, who had become interested in our church. Uh, I guess she's a student up at uh, Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley. And she had concerns. She's not an Adventist. And she, had, she was just wondering, you know, is your church accepting you guys? Uh, you know, she was like asking questions. And Ron said, well, let me ask you a question. Are you a sinner? And she said, yes. He said, well, then you're, you're good. You're welcome. Because if you're not a sinner, it, would, it wouldn't be a good place for you. It wouldn't be a good fit. Because we're all sinners here. So it doesn't matter your stripe of sin. We're all sinners here looking for, for hope and help and healing and salvation through Jesus Christ. All are invited into the family of God. The Holy Spirit brought grace. The word grace and the word gift in the, in the New Testament, they have similar roots. It's the word charis. And the Holy Spirit brings the gift and the grace of God to us. It's, it's, God gives us what we do not deserve at all. He gives us what we do not earn at all. We can't work for it. It's just a gift. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit propelled the church into prominence. The new community of believers actually made a difference in their community. There's, there's many uh, uh, indications from history that the early church was one of the most important segments of society during uh, great um, famine and uh, outbreaks of disease. They would go and, and minister to people that nobody else wanted to touch because they were afraid of, of being contaminated. And they provided food, and they provided help, and they provided uh, uh, physical and medical care to people. So, so if, as a church, we have that gift of hospitality, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit who makes us aware of the need of other people, I mean, why wouldn't people want to be around us? Well, maybe sometimes it's because we want to talk their heads out, off about convincing them of some ideas that we have <laughs> instead of just following the example of Jesus, ministering first to their needs, and then say, you know, have you thought about this man called Jesus? I want to tell you about my relationship with him. Things were never the same, never the same as a result of their life in the community, their lives of ministry and service. The last uh, characteristic that I see in Acts is reverence and worship. Reverence and worship. It says in Acts 2, 4, uh, 46 and 47. There we go. They worship together at the temple each day, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. Kind of referred to this earlier. Their, their worship was from the heart. It wasn't segmented or restricted to a certain time. Sometimes 
I would challenge my congregation to get outside of the holy hour, you know, the Adventist hour. When I was a kid growing up in Southern California on Channel 5, KTLA, they had uh, the church had contracted to have a, a TV show on Sundays. It was called the Adventist Hour. It was Sabbath shown on Sunday. It was very interesting. One time they came to our church, Riverside, uh, uh, Riverside Seventh-day Adventist Church, and they set up the cameras and they set up the lights and they told us how things ought to be. <laughs> And then we got to see ourselves the next day. That was so special. So pre, <laughs> it was a prequel to uh, the way things are nowadays. Everybody has cameras in their church. But our worship of God isn't limited to one hour on one day of the week. Our worship of God should flow out of a sense of awe of who God is and what he's doing and what he's done and what he says he will do. Worship was a daily lifestyle as much as it was a weekly assembly. It took place in homes, by the sea, in the streets, in the courts of the temple. It was the lifeblood of the early believers, the adoration and worship of Jesus, the Messiah. They didn't think about the forms of worship. Their, their religious culture was filled with forms of worship. That's not what they were thinking about. They were thinking about the person that they worshipped. Within your very name, Community Adventist Fellowship, I thought about this. There's the core elements of the original people of the way. The words community and fellowship, as we've talked about, have their origins in the New Testament, in the New Testament church. And Adventist, just like the apostles and early, early believe, believers lived every day with the expectancy that Jesus would come again, Adventist is what we expect. Jesus to come again, to consummate the great plan of salvation. Right here, right here in this little part of God's family, and God's family is huge, isn't it? It's, it's in so many places. God, God's spirit is causing his family to thrive in so many ways. Right here, there's such a tapestry of lives from different backgrounds and ethnicities and languages, and viewpoints, and experiences. Some of you are just beginning your experience with the Lord, and your experience uh, on the journey of faith. Others, you've been on the road for a long, long time. There are parents who care for and fear for the spiritual well-being of their children. There are professionals and students, visionaries and workers, all drawn together by the binding thread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in spite of our propensities for human organizations and buildings, I know that the apostles, if they came today and they look beyond some of the issues that we have and some of the presenting things, if they, if they got to know us, I believe they would still recognize the true church of Jesus Christ. Because the church is not primarily a place to exercise religion uh, religious rituals or teach abstract theology. It's not primarily a denomination or a nonprofit organization. It is first and foremost a group of people who are sold out to and connected with God through Jesus Christ. And yet even as we consider this amazing picture, and this is the thing that, that God really opened my mind to as I was going through this study, even as we consider this amazing picture, this window in, into the church of the book of Acts and all that it was about, all that it accomplished and its characteristics, I'm struck by the reality that this is not a, pres uh, a prescriptive picture. This is not God saying to, to us, now if you will have more fellowship, if you would have more uh, uh, proclaiming of the gospel, if you would do these things more, if you would worship more, if you do all this stuff more, you focus in on doing that, then things would change. You would get what you're really looking for. That's not the picture. This is a descriptive picture. If we attempt to reenact or appropriate these characteristics in order to re recreate the primitive church, we're going to miss the point because in all of this, there is one common thread, and that thread is Jesus. So if we're going to focus, on anything in our church, we need to focus on Jesus Christ. And I mean Jesus, the real Jesus, the living Christ. Jesus did not 
come to establish the way. He said, I am the way, right? I am the way. There's no fellowship or good news or discipleship or spiritual gifts or worship apart from Jesus, because he is the reason for all of those things. He's the center, the all in all, the inspiration and rationale, the purpose and power of anything and everything that makes up the church. Without him, we can do and we are nothing. We can do nothing and we are nothing. I want to conclude with something I wrote seven years ago because I was thinking a lot about Jesus, who he really is. So I just wanna, I just wanna read this and then we'll, we'll pray. Who is, who was Jesus really? What was it like to listen to him talk? How would I have felt if I had looked directly, if he had looked directly at me during one of his teaching sessions? I've been wondering more and more if I really know this man of Galilee as well as I thought I did. And I'm beginning to recognize that there's so much more about the real Jesus. I've always had a knowledge about him. He's there in my earliest memories. I heard the stories as a child. I memorized the verses. Remember Sabbath school memory verses? Anybody have to do that? You get a little ribbon or a star or something. I learned the lessons from my teachers, but the Jesus I thought I knew is in some ways a person of my own invention. The projection of my needs or fears or beliefs onto the written record of his life and words and deeds. I have an emotional attachment to the name, to the idea of him, but my picture of Jesus is my picture. One of millions, if not billions, all a little bit different or maybe very different from each other. But who is he? Surely he was not so otherworldly that divinity obscured his human personality. And what kind of person could have such an unaffected charisma as he did or held the same kind of power he did with such humility? What were his idiosyncrasies, the timbre of his voice, the look of his hands or the way he moved. What would it have been to been like to actually hear him speak of the kingdom of heaven and hear the passion rise in his voice or to catch the glint of holy fire flashing? He could not have attracted thousands or left such a crater in the landscape of history without personality, without the force that accompanies true conviction, without some sort of characteristics that bind him to the human race. At the time I wrote this, I I also had discovered this picture's artist's rendition. And and it's kind of take off from the shroud. You know, you've seen pictures of the shroud. Only Jesus' eyes are open. He's not dead. I look at one artist's picture of Christ, shroud-like with eyes open. They are eyes that can see the depths of my soul and every layer of who I am. But do I truly know the man that that picture represents? I've preached about him, taught his lessons, sung songs to him for many years now. And all of a sudden it seems I'm just beginning to discover Jesus. A desire is welling up in me to know him like I've never known him before. I'm being driven to set aside what I need him to be, what I thought him to be, and to discover who he really is. I want to know him more. I want to know him better. I want to know him even as he knows me. And as you think about your relationship to God today and and to the church I pray that you will hear the voice of Jesus calling you to follow him for the first time or once again for the thousandth time. Follow him in the way, the way to God. To join the rest of this family and being part of the people of the way. And I want to end with this prayer of Paul from the book of Ephesians. 
I pray for you to see clearly and really understand who Christ is and all that he has done for you. Let's pray. Lord, it seems uh, unseemly for someone as sinful and human as I am to even talk about you, and yet that's exactly what you have assigned us to do. Because you didn't come to deliver fine speech with perfect words, you came to change hearts and lives and to call each one of us to see the beauty and the truth and the life that resides in you. And so I just pray for this congregation today, God, that you would take the love that exists here and increase it, that you would, you would minister to those who are hurting physically, emotionally, maybe financially, maybe with problems that seem completely uh, uh, beyond help. That you would minister to them, God, in their need. I pray that you would use them to make a difference in the lives of the people that you've brought into their world and in, into their lives. That you would, you would use them to shine the light of Jesus Christ right where they are and through them uh, so that others may come to know you. That's the genius of your spirit. That's the purpose of your family is that we may bring glory to you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And I pray this in Jesus' name.